this. Uh, don't forget uh, our New Year's Eve service. And we'll have the Haven Heirs will be with us and we'll have the Laytons will be with us that night. We're going to start about 8 o'clock. We're going to sing and worship and just praise the Lord till about 10. We're going to go down and have some refreshments and then we're going to come back up and we're going to sing and worship and praise God for a little while and about five minutes till 12. We're going to stop everything. We're going to get in these altars. We're going to pray this old year out and the new year in and ask God's blessing on the new year. Do you know why I... I and while I'm while I'm got it on my mind, there won't be any service here Wednesday night. We won't have service Wednesday night, but we'll be back here uh, next Sunday. We'll be back in full swing again, uh, hopefully. And uh, uh, but you, <clears throat> we've got much that we need to pray about. Pray for all these that are sick and afflicted, and uh, and. These that have lost loved ones. There's just a lot that we need to, to pray about. Look around you, see who's not here. Make you a note and call them when you get home. Tell them you missed them being in the house of God. In Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to begin. I mean, yeah, Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to begin reading. At verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you are called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity. Now I want you to underline this verse of scripture right here. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascend, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things and gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, this right here, I want to stop for just a minute. And where he, this term edifying for the body of Christ, that means for the equipping or the building up of the body of Christ, okay? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness <coughs> whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, now underline this, may grow up unto him, uh, into him in all things which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I'm going to start right there, but if you go and read verse 17, it talks about putting off the old man, putting on the new man, and uh, so on and so forth. But I, I want to uh, talk to you just a little bit about uh, our Christian work. <coughs> and uh, as we 
uh, are coming to the end of this church year. And as we're fixing to go into the next year, I believe it's important that we understand what Paul is telling us. And I believe that if we go into the next year, and, and, and as we dissect this and, and uh, this scripture and kind of lay it out to you and tell you what Paul is, is saying here to the church at Ephesus, I believe that if we had put on these traits and these values as Christians, I believe that we would see great things happen in our Christian walk. And, Amen. Uh, so I guess if I had a text, I wouldn't even, uh, it would be, how should Christians walk? How should Christians walk? Now, I noticed the first thing that, uh, you know, uh, nothing uh, presses more earnestly in the scriptures than the walk of a child of God. And as we walk as Christians, uh, we're, uh, as we walk like Christ, we're called Christians. And, uh, uh, but I, I noticed the first thing, now I want you to notice the first thing that Paul said here, he said by lowliness. See, we got to understand if we're going to walk in a, in, in a, a, a Christian walk, the first thing we've got to understand is we can't walk it with pride in our heart. We've got to walk it humbly before God. Amen. You know, uh, uh, if there's anything that I've ever learned uh, down this Christian walk, it is that uh, God blesses the humble. And you know, when, when we get pride built up in our lives and, and, and we get to, as I say, uh, a lot of times, uh, get our shoulder out of joint, uh, patting ourselves on the back, we can't walk for Christ like that. We've got to understand that if we're going to serve him, we've got to do it humbly. And we've got to, uh, you know, and uh, I understand more uh, why Christians are taken advantage of every day of my life. It's because we're humble people. We don't go around boasting and uh, prideful and uh, doing all these things. But if we're a child of God, we walk humbly before God. And the world don't understand that. And especially this world that we're living in today, it's the maddest world i ever seen in my life. They don't understand turning the other cheek. They don't understand the doctrine that Christ taught rather when he said uh, 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 if he slaps you on one cheek, turn to him the other one. No. They don't understand that uh, when you're being persecuted to pray for them. That pers They don't understand that. They don't understand how children of God can take all of this stuff that's put on them and still walk humbly before God. Amen. And it's hard. I'm telling you, the hardest thing in a Christian's life is to become humble. Especially when you brought up like we was brought up or like I was brought up. You know, uh, where, where we was brought up, we are just little old country folks and uh, we were taught all of our life, you don't let nobody run over you. You defend yourself. You, you know, you do these things. And, and then as you, when you become a Christian, you notice that all these things that you've been taught all your life will not work in the life of a Christian. Mm -hmm. You can't punch folks out and be a Christian. <laughs> Amen. Even though you want to sometimes. I can't tell you there's not time that I want to just take it and, and stick it right in somebody's mouth. <laughs> Especially when I hear them down in my church or down in uh, my Lord and all. I get mad. Right. I get mad when I hear people uh, talking about Christians 
Like I get mad when I'm, I hear them use God's name in vain and use it like a byword. I get mad at these things. But then the Holy Spirit of God speaks to me. And he says, look, there's no use getting mad, just pray for them. It's hard to pray for folks when they are mistreating you. That's right. Amen. It is hard when you are feel like you are being done wrong to get on your knees and say, God, forgive them. But you remember uh, Billy preached here about the sayings on the cross. When they were hanging, when they hung our Savior on the cross and he looked out over the crowd. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. It's hard for folks to understand a doctrine like that. But if we're going to be children of God, and we're going to walk a uh, Christian life, and if we're going to win folks to God, we've got to first become humble. I'll tell you something else. You've never been saved if you didn't become humble. I won't never forget, everybody talks about the night they're saved. I won't never forget the afternoon that I was saved. When I knelt in an old-fashioned altar of prayer, I didn't kneel down there smiling and chewing, chewing gum and laughing and cutting up. But my heart was broken and I got Amen. down humble before God and I said, Lord, I realize I'm the sorriest thing that ever walked. Ain't nothing good about me. But you, you're the only thing good that I know. And Lord, I need you to save Amen. me. Amen. <coughs> Let me tell you something. You can get full of pride if you want to, but it ain't going to do nothing but cause you to self-destruct. So we have to walk humbly. Then the next thing he said, with meekness. Hmm. You remember what Jesus taught in the Beatitudes? He said the meek would inherit the earth. And that little word meekness. The commentary that I was studying in put it like this. Meekness, that excellent disposition of the soul which makes men unwilling to provoke, not easily be provoked or offended, we find much in ourselves for which we can hardly forgive ourselves. Therefore, we must not be surprised if we find in others that which we think it hard to forgive. Meekness. To be a little old meek, humble child of God that don't provoke folks to anger. Now let me say this, and I want you to understand what I'm saying. I have let my mouth cause me to get in more problems than anything else. Uh, what was it the writer said? The tongue's an unruly evil and nobody can tame it. When we say something, when we let that Phrase come out of our mouth, you can't call it back. Amen. It don't matter how sorry you feel later. It don't matter how much you wish you hadn't have said it. Once you said it, it is said and it is forever out there and you can never bring it back. Amen. My daddy used to tell me one of the worst faults I had was my mouth engaged before my brain did. <laughs> and a lot of us are that way. Our mouth engages before our brain does. Or before our heart does, should I say. 
And it's hard. And, and you know, we all have that little uh, Faith Whiteman used to tell me it's hard, it was hard for her to get her halo down over them horns. <laughs> <coughs> we all have that tendency to say smart aleck things. But you know what? And sometimes it's not what you say, it's the way you say it. Amen. I prayed more, I guess, this past year for God to help me not to say things that offend than I ever have. Now, if me preaching you the truth, hey, uh, you get mad at me for preaching you the truth, you just have to get mad because I'm not going to apologize for that. But I'm not talking about preaching. I'm talking about in our everyday walk saying things that offend people. We need to stop it. We don't need to do that. And as we move forward as a body, and I'm going to get into that uh, in just a few minutes. As we move forward as a body uh, of believers, uh, here at Pine View for the next year. My prayer is that we all engage our brain and our heart before we engage our mouth. Amen. That we don't say hurtful things about people. I'm going to tell you something. You say, well, preacher, if I say it uh, to, uh, to Bud uh, in private, it ain't going to get out. Let me tell you, let me give you a good lesson on that. I was sitting one day, Bud and I, right in here in the office, and we were discussing something. I didn't know anybody was around, Bud didn't either. But while we were talking, I heard somebody out there in the hall, and I opened the door, and there was somebody standing there in the hallway. Now what we were discussing was something that was church business and it was about somebody that had joined the church and whether or not we should allow them to join the church because of some problems. I was talking to my deacon in confidence. But there was somebody standing outside that heard us. They wasn't just standing outside, they was eavesdropping and they heard it. Now, I wished a thousand times that I had a waited and Bud and I got off somewhere where it wouldn't have been nobody but me and him. But I didn't. And that has haunted me for three years here at this church. I didn't intentionally hurt anybody. And what we were discussing was none of nobody's business. But I said it. And I said it in a place where people could hear. And I shouldn't have done that. Now, there's probably been conversations that have taken place. And you thought, Susan one time was in a, in a grocery store talking to Billy Bertram. Their telephone come on and called me and I heard everything they said. <laughs> when she got home, I got to tell her what her and Billy was talking about and scared her to death. She thought I'd done got psychic on her. <laughs> but we need to be careful what we say. In the first place, if we don't say anything hurtful, it don't matter who's listening. Amen. If we don't say anything hurtful, it don't matter if the cell phone comes on, does it, Johnny? We need to watch what we say. We don't need to provoke anybody to uh, jealousy. We don't need to provoke them to anger. We need to be careful. And especially around our children. Amen. We've got some good kids in this church. Amen. Tanner, I appreciate that prayer this morning. Amen. Thank God. I, uh, them two kids are good kids right there. And I thank God for them. And it ain't just them. All these kids are good kids. There's two good and sitting back there with uh, 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 Sheila right now. 
They're good kids. We saw kids come to this altar and give their heart and life to God. And some of them will probably be coming to church here occasionally. We need to teach them how to live. And right now while they're young is the time that we need to teach them that meekness is a trait that a child of God needs. You need to be meek. And it's hard. Especially when you're redneck Christians like we are. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got a lot of red on my neck. <laughs> you know where I think that term come from, don't you? It come from the farm. Right. People out there working on the farm and their, uh, their uh, necks would get blistered and they called them redneck, just old country boys. So there's a lot of rednecks in Pine View Baptist Church, and, yeah. and we just need to be careful. We need to uh, we need to make sure that we're me. Now, the main thing. Now we're getting into the meat of what we need to do. The main thing is there is one Christ, one God. Amen. One Amen. Holy Spirit. Amen. And we need to be as they are. We need to become one. Right. Amen. My heart's desire Amen. for this church this year is that if you hit Bud on the toe, Alan hollers. <laughs> I'd like to see this church become so close Amen. that if you offend one, you offend all. If you hurt one, you hurt all. God bless. If you bless one, you bless all. Amen. Now, that's what Christ taught us. He said, I and my Father are one. Mm -hmm. they, are, they were of one mind. They were of one accord. One spirit. You can't separate God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. I don't care how you That's do right. it. You Amen. cannot separate. I saw folks make fools of themselves trying to do that. <laughs> They're all one God. And they all have different offices. Now, here we go. Hang on. All of us should be one. Amen. We have different offices that we feel. Amen. Every one of us have different jobs. We can't all sing like Loretta. Amen. We can't all teach like Glenn. <clears throat> He's one of the best teachers I ever heard. Amen. We can't all do the jobs that everybody else does. But what we can do is we can all get a job and do it. Amen. 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 And there's something for everybody here to do. Amen. Yeah. Listen, you, some of you ladies say, well, I don't know how to do nothing. Ladies, if it wasn't mm -hmm. for y'all cooking and stuff for us, I don't know what we'd do. Now, and there's a good example. All of you don't make the same dish, do you? Mama makes nine or put. But she's good at it too. Tink makes banana pudding. She's good at it. Betty makes that, that pineapple casserole. And she's good at it. Mama makes good chicken dressing. The best fried okra in town right there. Amen. All of you have special dishes that you cook. And all of you, the, the dish that you cook. Hey, I like that veg all casserole, Cheryl fixes. There's just, I like all of it. Ain't that many y'all cook it? I don't like it. There ain't no use me lying about it. Hey, I can dig in, can't you, Derek? Yeah, you can. Me and old Daryl just sit over there and eat and smile while everybody else is running around the table. We just go pile ours up and come sit down and eat. But all of you do your things differently. Nobody 
does them the same. Miss Abs, a good event planner. She is good at that. She dots every I and she crosses every T. She makes sure nobody's left out. She does good at what she does. Everybody here has a job that they do well. And I appreciate the job that all of you do. So the first thing I'm saying, let's do our job to the best of our ability, whatever God's called us to do. Amen. Let's do it together in one mind and in one accord. Let's do it without jealousy and without anger. Let's do it like God would want it done. And if we'll do it, if all of this uh, uh, bind together, you say, preacher, you ain't preaching, jumping up and down like you usually do. No, I want this to get across to you. <laughs> if we'll all do what we're supposed to do, then everything else will work out fine. Now, he said there's one body fitly joined together. Now, you take this body. Every part of this body has a function, even to these little fingers. If you don't believe it, you get one that you can't use anymore, and you'll find out. I have dropped, I have broke more glasses since I messed that hand up than I ever have. I'll get a hold of it, and I think I'm holding it. Next thing you know, it fell on the floor. And Susie's fussing at me about having to clean it up. No, she's not really. She don't fuss at me about stuff like that. But when, the, when one part of the body is missing, or it's not functioning properly, the whole body hurts because of it. When one member of this church is not doing what they need to be doing, it hurts the whole body. Amen. Daryl brings me water every time I preach. I'm going to tell you something. You say, well, that, that, don't mean, that means a lot to me. It's not what you do. If you take a job, now listen to me, if you take a job in this church, you ought to do your very best to do that job. Mm -hmm. To the best of your ability. Don't shrug it off and say, well, I'll do this tomorrow. I'll, do, I'll catch up next week. Do it and do it for God. Amen. It ain't about what you're getting paid to do it. It's about doing it for God. Amen. Do it like you're supposed to do it. Bless you, Lord. <clears throat> we all have one faith. And I'm going to tell you something. That faith will get us through when nothing else will. Right. Amen. Amen. I've seen more faith exercised at Pine View in 2013 than the whole time I've been here. I believe God has finally convinced you that he will do what he said he'd do. Right. And that he's not slack concerning his promises. Hallelujah. He will do what we asked him to do. If you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to a mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. God has moved mountains at Pine View in 2013, and I believe he's going to move more in 2014. Amen. 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 Have you ever noticed that this body... Got several fingers, got two eyes, two ears, got two nostrils, but it don't have but one heart. This church ought to have one heart. We ought to all. Now listen to me. Listen to what I'm telling you. 
We ought to all. If our heart is where it ought to be with God, then all these other things will fall right into place. Right. Amen. You know, when you, when you start thinking about what really pushes a church forward? Our faith in God, our believing in Him. Now listen, I don't know what you believe. I don't even, uh, you know, I believe that we all entered into covenant here and we all believe what that covenant said. Some of you may not have ever even read the Articles of Faith. You may not even know what they are. But I believe that all of us believe this, that there is one Savior who is Lord over all. Right. That he was born of a virgin. That he lived some 33 years. That he went to a cross. He died. He gave his life on Calvary. Shed his blood there for us. That he died and on the third day he rose. That's what our faith is based on. Amen. That's our one heart that we all have is we know that our salvation came through our Lord and Savior Amen. Jesus Christ and the Amen. finished that's work it. of Calvary. Right. That's, what, and I, that's what matters the most. Mm -hmm. Now I want to talk about, he said, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. I believe that if you're saved by the grace of God, you'll want to be baptized. Now, do I believe it's essential to salvation? No, I don't. But I believe it's necessary. Why do you believe it's necessary? Because it's an outward expression. It's telling the world that I have died. That old man has died. I have buried him. He's not coming back. Right. And I've risen up a new man. And I'm going to walk Amen. in a newness of life. That's what baptism represents. Yeah. It ain't about just going in here and getting in that water and ducking somebody and getting them out. And, uh, it ain't just a formality. You wonder why Baptists believe in baptism so much. That's why. It is when, when we go down into that watery grave, we believe that that old man has died and stays there. Never to be resurrected. That new man comes forth. Amen. A new life. All things, the former things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. <laughs> ain't that good there? Now you ain't even drunk no more. You ain't a drug addict no more. Amen. That died with that old man. Amen. Amen. All of them things that we used to be that we're so ashamed of. Those things that Satan keeps telling us. You can't ever forgive yourself for that. It's so hard when you look back and see some of the things that you've done. And Satan just keeps bringing it up. Just keeps telling you, you ain't going to never be forgiven for that. But then the sweet Holy Ghost of God speaks and he said, hey, you've already been forgiven. Amen. Amen. Forget it! Amen. Paul said, I'm putting all those things behind me. All those things I count but dumb that I might know Christ Amen. and the power of his resurrection. And that's the last thing that I want to talk to you about is the power that we have through Jesus Christ. Listen, you don't have to be a little old weak Christian. You don't have to, <laughs> and uh, you know, a lot of denominations, how do I say this without offending anybody? <laughs> Baptists believe that the process of sanctification begins when you accept Christ. And that it goes until the time that you meet Him. That you 
uh, that sanctification is a process of getting better, of knowing more, of learning more about God. Some folks use that sanctification as, uh, I don't know what to use. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what sanctification is. Right. Sanctification is growing in the grace of Christ. That's what I mean. And that's my prayer for us. That we would grow not only in His grace, but in His power mm -hmm. to realize that there is, as the song says, power in the blood. I like that song. There is power, yeah. power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Then goes on said, Would you be free from your burden of sin? Hallelujah. There's power in the blood. They're trying to free you. There's power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. Oh, listen. Do you believe that today? I believe there's power in the blood of Christ. There's power to save. There's power uh, uh, to heal. There's power to sanctify. There's power to grow in the grace of God. There is power for healing. There's power for whatever we need in our life. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Amen. 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 I want to see you exercise that power yeah. in 2014. I want to see some of you shout. <laughs> you say, well, preacher, what do y'all want to shout for? Why don't we want to shout? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Why don't we want to lift up our hands and praise God? Listen, he freed me. He saved me. Lord, have mercy. Oh, yeah. All these things that he has done for me, why would I not want to shout? That's Amen. what I want to know. Amen. Amen. Why would I not want to praise him? Amen. Why would I want to come in and sit in his house in a place where he said that he would meet me and look like I've been sucking on a pickle all day? Why would I want to do that? Why wouldn't I want to come into his house and walk through those doors with thanksgiving? Why wouldn't I want to come in and shout a little while? Why wouldn't I want to tell folks that Jesus saves? Why wouldn't I want to let you know what I, that this Savior that gave his life on Calvary, what he means to me? Why wouldn't I want to testify? That power that he gave us, that precious grace of God, those precious mercies that we have every day, why wouldn't I want to shout that? Thank God for all these things. And if we will do these things in 2014, you may not pack the house full but I tell, uh, of people but I tell you what you will do you'll pack the house full of praise mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> and you'll see things happen in your personal Christian walk that you would have never believed would have happened you'll see Holy Ghost boldness in yourself say oh I'm bashful preacher I just, it's hard for me to witness because I'm bashful Pray for Holy Ghost boldness. Amen. Amen. God's got it. Bless you, Lord. Whatever you do that you need for <coughs> serving Him, He has for you. Amen. Would you trust Him? 
Would you just allow him to let you walk like you need to walk in 2000?